Uh, my name is Jessica Gilbert, and it is my honor to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ruth DeFries. Uh, before the symposium, I was saying in jest with a friend that every assignment I have written and paper I have written, I have quoted or cited Dr. DeFries to only realize later that that was in fact true, that I've always quoted her land use change research. So it is my honor to introduce her uh, to EIS. Uh, Dr. DeFries earned her undergraduate degree at Washington University in St. Louis and her PhD in Geography and Environmental Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. Currently, she is a professor of Ecology and Sustainable Development at Columbia University in New York in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Evolutionary Bi and Environmental Biology. In her work, she combines remote satellite imagery and field surveys to examine how the world's demands for food and other resources are changing land use throughout the tropics. Her research quantifies how these land use changes affect climate, biodiversity, and other ecosystem services, as well as human development. For her scientific contributions, Dr. DeFries was elected as a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, one of the country's highest scientific honors. She is a fellow of the Ecological Society of America, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Geophysical Union, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the Alden Leopold Leadership Program of the ESA. She received a MacArthur Genius Award in 2007, in, in addition to many other honors and achievements throughout her career. In addition to publishing over 100 scientific papers, she is committed to communicating the nuances and complexities of sustainable development to popular audiences, most recently in her book, The Big Ratchet, How Humanity Thrives in the Face of Natural Crisis. Her research has been published in journals such as Nature, Science, PNAS, Global Change Biology, Bioscience, Conservation Letters, and Ecological Applications. Dr. DeFries is committed to linking science with policy, for example, through her involvement with the High Carbon Stock Study on Sustainable Palm Oil, the Environmental Defense Fund, Science for Nature and People, and Reconciling Conservation and Development in Central India. Please join me in welcoming Dr. DeFries to the stage. Jessica, it's a pleasure to be here. This is a wonderful symposium, and I'd like to add my thanks to all the students who have pulled this together with such competence, grace, and enthusiasm. It is truly a pleasure to be here. And also to Jessica, who literally went the extra few hundred miles last night on the eve of the symposium to fetch me from the uh, Dallas airport. So that really was above and beyond. Truly, really, it's, it's wonderful to see this, uh, this event together. So, um, I'd like to follow on uh, Dr. Pim's nice presentation, which uh, highlighted how important it is for us to um, conserve the land that we have for uh, the other species that we share this planet with. We do have seven billion some people in the world, and we did hear from Dr. Naughton this morning how an <coughs> effort like Payment for Ecosystem Services, which seems like it should be a real win-win, is actually quite difficult on the ground. So this is really a very messy uh, business that we're in. And it's made even more complicated, or maybe not, maybe there's opportunities in it, uh, from the very large dynamic which is taking place in the world today, and that is the uh, dynamic of urbanization. So I'd like to start with the story of this farmer. Uh, she is in central India, a rather remote part of the country, not particularly well connected, not nearby any major big city, uh, and this is from some field work uh, last year, uh, talking to her about what she grows in her field. She grows an absolute gorgeous uh, agro-diversity of many, many different species that you can't see in this picture, but there are actually quite a few species in there in her field. And she was telling us about how her daughter is studying, going on to college, how her son is in the town doing labor, and then the knowledge that she has is not being passed on to the next generation. So who will do the work that she uh, has lived with for her whole life uh, in the next generation? And the answer is that, that the next generation really will not be doing this work. 
many people will be off doing desk jobs, doing urban jobs, may visit their, their um, ancestral lands, but will not have the same level of knowledge about the agrodiversity and the landscape that the, these uh, farmers have. And that's a very different dynamic for the world. So this is one farmer in one place, and you can multiply this by millions and millions of farmers throughout uh, the tropics. Same dynamic. So we're living in a very different world. We know that population growth has been a very big force in the last few decades, but we've seen the peak of population growth. The peak rate of population growth was in the 1970s, and we can expect from the demographers that population will stabilize, um, maybe in the middle of this uh, century. But we are still in the midst of very urban, very rapid urban um, growth and an increasing share of the world's population living in urban areas, which will reach 60-some, close to 70% by 2030 is the projection. And where is that happening? That's happening in the less developed regions of the world, in the tropics, where we heard there is such an um, importance for uh, biodiversity. Of course, in our part of the world, we're quite used to this. We've had negative population growth in rural areas going back to when this graphic starts in uh, 1950. But in the tropics, in the less developed regions of the world, we're just at that turning point where the uh, rate of rural population growth is becoming negative, stabilizing or negative, while the population growth that will continue, nine some billion uh, people, all of that, almost all of that growth will be seen in urban areas. So this is a very different world. It's very different way of being for our species, very different for uh, the human enterprise, whereas many people have gotten their sustenance off of the land directly by farming or hunting. Now we have more and more people in urban areas which need to be uh, fed from uh, surplus. And where that, producing that surplus is a big um, challenge for the world and a big change in the way that we think about our relationship to uh, natural resources through food production. And this first came home, or hit me, what a big difference this is. A few years ago, doing some analysis on the drivers of uh, deforestation. And what we saw there was that we tend to think about de tropical deforestation as driven by um, smallholders, uh, people clearing land for agriculture, for pasture, uh, for that sort of thing. But what we found with this analysis was that the highest, um, the countries with the highest rates of deforestation were those countries which had the highest growth rates in urban population and the highest um, export rates. So the, the uh, deforestation to produce the, uh, the crops, the agricultural produce, to feed people in cities. This is not necessarily cities expanding, but rather produce the demand that's created by cities leading to uh, production in the landscape, leading to new deforestation. So that's a, that's a very different type of uh, driver. Connected globalization, trade, uh, very complex uh, drivers. And we weren't the only ones who found this result. There's been quite a bit of literature on this topic about the teleconnections, the increasing role of trade and demands that are far away from where the commodities are produced that are changing the way that people use uh, the landscape. So there are, for instance, uh, scenes like this. This is in Gabon in Central Africa. Highly deforested, a highly forested country, lots of forest cover, and we see and dense, uh, sparse populations, dense urban populations, sparse, very sparse rural populations, and we have scenes like this of deforestation, and this happens to be clearing in uh, up-and-coming oil palm concession. 
So you can see scenes like this in many places throughout the world now, where the deforestation is not for local production, but to produce a commodity that is consumed someplace very, very uh, distant. And that's really the existing model that we have for land use and economic development. That's certainly what happened in this country when the, uh, the, the Midwest became uh, productive and connected by uh, transport, and the less productive, productive areas in the uh, Northeast were abandoned and regrew as uh, forest. And that, that pattern is seen in many, many places, and that's been the model. And we don't really have any other model for um, economic development, producing the surplus of food that people need, the, the laborers in urban areas need to stay. So that, that's the, the dominant model that we have, and it's a model for a good reason. It's been very successful. There, uh, the many, many people have been lifted out of uh, poverty. If we go back 100 years, 150 years, <coughs> Most of the world's population was living in poverty, and that has reduced now to the level where uh, it's um, less than 10% of people living on, um, in chronic poverty. So I think we can all agree that that is absolutely a good thing, but as we know, it can be, has been, at the expense of the planet, at the expense of other species, and at the expense of some of the ecosystem services like the um, biocrusts and uh, watershed protection and so on, on which we rely. So we have scenes like this. This is in the uh, southern Amazon, which is a, a, a big soy production area, which was once a tropical forest. So the questions that I try to think about is how is this massive dynamic that we're seeing now in urbanization throughout many parts of the world, particularly throughout the tropics, how is that reshaping rural uh, landscapes because of the demand that's created in the urban areas? And even more so, how can our science help think through this this new way that we are as a species. How can we provide the scientific understanding and the scientific base to help with the land use decisions that can sustain those urban populations? That's the dynamic that um, is, is not going to turn around. Uh, and, and at the same time, protect nature, protect the other species, protect the ecosystem services that we rely on from the rural landscapes. So to Cut to the bottom line of the points I wanted to make today, and I'm going to follow up with a couple of examples, is that uh, this is always a, a thinking process that uh, continues to develop. But how do we think about creating that science base? And I'd imagine that many of you in the, in the room here think deeply about what science we can be doing that can inform, that can help, that can make uh, uh, decisions um, take into account nature and ecosystem services while providing the food and other resources that people need. So some of the things that I've realized, it seem rather obvious, but maybe they're worth stating, is, uh, is three kind of ideas. One is that we often do kind of global scale analysis, and that's wonderful, that gives us a good overview, a good picture. But when we're doing the science to really connect with decisions about landscape management, I think we can be most effective in our science if we frame it in terms of this, matching the scale of our analysis with the scale at which decisions are being made. And I think Dr. Pim said that very nicely, that uh, conservation is all, all local. Um, and I think we need to remember that at the outset of our research design. A second idea is that I think we have to recognize what people really care about, what most people really care about, and most people really care about, and of course we care about too, our everyday lives. So people care about their health, people care about not being stuck in a dust storm, um, people care about having healthy food, people care about things that affect them on an everyday basis. The 
issues of climate, biodiversity, not that these aren't important issues, but they're very abstract to many people. Um, and they seem far away, and they seem long term, and they seem like somebody else's problem. How can we match our science that can address the issues that people can identify with readily on their everyday, in their everyday lives, and also benefit those other issues that we care a lot about? And the third idea is that um, I think those of us who have been fortunate to be on the stage here today grew up in a generation where the science was focused on identifying the problems. What are the problems out there? The problems of um, loss of biodiversity, the problems of climate change, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of science and a lot of good science that's been done around identifying those problems. But I think we're in a different world now in that when we think about how we frame our science, I try to think about it in terms of not just identifying what the problem is, but how can our science help inform what the solution might be. So it's a different way of framing the, our scientific questions. So I want to follow up these three kind of ideas about how we might think about our science uh, with some examples. And the first example relates to um, oil palm. So these are oil palm uh, fruits, and each one of those is maybe a little bigger than the size of a walnut. Absolutely beautiful. The colors are gorgeous. Um, this is also an extremely valuable commodity. Oil palm is the most traded vegetable oil, the most consumed vegetable oil uh, in the world. It's extremely productive. It's extremely beneficial for, uh, for large businesses and smallholders alike uh, to produce uh, oil palm. And it is also uh, a very large driver of land use change in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Indonesia, and increasingly in um, Latin America and Central Africa as well. And you can see what a valuable commodity this is uh, by looking at some statistics from the FAO, where we can see that the palm oil in the food supply per capita basis is on a very upward trajectory, particularly in emerging economies, India, China, um, Brazil, which have overtaken the uh, consumption in Europe. We don't see oil palm that much in this country. We don't really use it so much as a cooking oil like you see in um, other parts of the world as very much a part of the refined oil that people use. But oil palm is in a lot of products. So if you had any commercial baked products today, I don't know about those cookies, those Texas sized cookies out there. Um, if you used uh, soap, if you put on lipstick, um, Lots, if you had any processed food, very likely you used um, some oil palm today. It's used in a large variety of products. It's everywhere and it's also increasing. Imports of oil palm in this country are increasing because it has the same property as trans fats. So when, as trans fats are banned in some places like in New York City where I'm from, um, the substitute for that is, um, is palm oil. So it's very widely used and, uh, and increasing. So the demand is increasing and that's not likely to uh, stop anytime soon. So how does that relate to what we saw last September through November in Southeast Asia? So here's a picture and I think you probably can't see where that is because it is just blanketed in smoke. This is over uh, Sumatra and um, Borneo in Southeast Asia. And last September through November, there was an extremely severe episode of fires and haze that spread throughout the region. This did not get uh, the media attention that it deserved because it was a very, very big effect in this region. I think our media is preoccupied with other unmentionable things right now. Um, but it affected, this haze event affected millions of people. 
Uh, the smoke and emissions blew to Singapore, to Kuala Lumpur, as far as Thailand, throughout the region. Uh, closed schools, uh, airports were closed, enormously high economic cost and public health cost. And we can zoom into that box there, so this is zooming into the uh, southern part of Sumatra, and you can see the uh, smoke going off of the fires that happened at that time. Now this is uh, pretty much a phenomenon that happens every year during the dry season in that part of the world. And when there is an El Nino, which corresponds to dry conditions in uh, Southeast Asia, the fires are particularly uh, severe. So this happened in 2006, and I don't know if any of you can remember back to 97, 98, the very big El Nino, uh, where there was a very big effect throughout the region as well. So this is a very big political issue in this part of the world that Singapore blames Indonesia for the smoke that affects their citizens and closes their schools and, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, if, you, if you've spent any time in that region, particularly if you were there during this time, you'll know what a big impact this is. And this is not something that is far away, distant, you know, might affect your grandchildren. This is something that was help, affecting people um, every day. So this relates to um, the very common land management tool throughout many parts of the tropics in using fire. So fire in the humid tropics is not really so much a natural phenomena. It might occur sometimes, but extremely rarely. So the vast majority of fires that we see in the humid tropics are related to some human ignition cause. So people use fire to clear land, to, um, to reduce pests, to clear rubble from their fields, to get rid of trash, to uh, vandalize property, throwing away a cigarette that starts a fire, any number of reasons. There's a lot of fire throughout the tropics. Um, and those of you who work in the tropics will, uh, will know what, uh, I'm sure, will have seen the very common use of fire because it's cheap and effective way to get rid of uh, biomass that gets in the way of people doing things with the land that they would rather be doing, like um, growing crops or oil pump concessions or whatnot. So we've had a team in place for, I think, four or five years now, where we've tried to put together this story of the fires in, um, particularly in Indonesia, associated with land use and land use conversion and other types of land uses, and how that affects public health. So this isn't really, the focus of this isn't really so much on climate, although there is a big climate component because those fires are emitting a lot of um, carbon into the atmosphere. But we're focusing on something that people in that region care about a lot. And I would venture to say that they care more about, or immediately care more about this issue of air quality than about uh, um, some um, climate change, which might, um, might affect them at some point. Not that that issue isn't important, but this is a much more immediate issue. So we have a team that's looking at the land use, that's our part, working with atmospheric chemists and atmospheric modelers who, uh, who have the tools to uh, model the transport of the emissions from the fires and basically see where those emissions go, what population centers are those emissions affecting, and then the epidemiologists and the public health experts who uh, can quantify what that exposure in those population centers, the traces back to the emissions from the land use change, how many people are affected and what the impacts are or on mortality, mortality, morbidity, mortality, and the property damage and economic costs and, uh, and so on. So we've been working on this for a while and while we were very unhappy to see this event happen last year because so many millions of people were negatively affected, children were evacuated, it was really a very big deal. Um, it's really an opportunity to um, have these tools that we've been developing for several years and hopefully have them make a difference in the way that land use decisions are made. So this all goes back to the unfortunate geography of uh, Singapore. So here's a graphic of 
uh, the emissions, the darker red are the emissions in a high fire year 2006 and then the average over uh, several years. You can see where Singapore, Singapore isn't, uh, sorry, Singapore isn't um, identified there, but that's the, the tip at the, of the Malay Peninsula. So you can see from the wind patterns, so the wind patterns are indicated by the arrows here, that the emissions that are happening on the island of Sumatra are blowing straight across the strait and affecting the people in um, Singapore. The emissions that are happening in Kalantan, there you can see in Borneo, Kalantan, the Indonesian portion of Borneo, um, not that they're not important and not that they don't affect people, but they're not affecting the people in Singapore so much because the wind is blowing, uh, blowing the other way. And certainly, the people in Jakarta, the capital of um, Indonesia, which is on the island of Java, that big dot there, um, they're not affected at all. The wind is blowing in the other direction. So they're not getting the impact of the emissions associated with fires and land use management uh, from Sumatra in their own country uh, in the capital. So this also relates to the climate issue in a very big way because where most of the fires are and where the fires last the longest is in the uh, peat swamps, the tropical peat swamps that are located here you can see uh, in the red. So along the eastern coast of Sumatra is where many of these peat swamps are located. So peat swamps are basically meters and tens of meters thick of, um, of uh, stores of partly decomposed uh, carbon, there's a picture there, and um, to, to, um, for agriculture, these peat swamps are drained, which is the way the prairies in, in this country were drained for, uh, for agriculture. And when they're drained, they, uh, they dry up. And when they dry up, they're just waiting to ignite and uh, have a lot of emissions and have fires that can go on for, uh, for months and months. So what we have developed in this smoke team, which we, as we call it, is a modeling tool where we can say if you're in any particular place, if you are in Singapore, or if you're in Kuala Lumpur, or if you're in a, 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 a town or any place in the island of Sumatra, or wherever you are, which are the places which are contributing emissions that you are being affected by? So you can see here that Singapore is very highly affected by the emissions which are occurring in Sumatra on the west coast there, and that's where, the uh, east coast of Sumatra, and that's where the peatlands are located, and it's just all very unfortunate. And uh, there's been a lot of polit you know, political accusations back and forth, and the um, Indonesian president had to apologize to Singapore for this last event, and it's very, very messy. Um, but we have a tool now where we can say, if you wanted to reduce the emissions in Singapore, or you wanted to reduce the emissions for, uh, for Indonesians at large, where would be the most effective place to concentrate the efforts to reduce fires or have conservation efforts and reduce the fires to be able to minimize the public health impact on, um, on the people in that receptor site? So we've run through a couple of different scenarios where we look at what's the, what's the likely land use change based on different types of scenarios, a business as usual, a high deforestation scenario, a peak protection scenario. And what we see from these numbers here, and if we trace through all these numbers, is depending on where you are, these scenarios are going to affect you differently. But overall, we see that the most effective way to reduce the exposure in different population centers, like Singapore, Palembang, which is a town in uh, Sumatra, and throughout all of Equatorial Asia, is to protect the people. If we protect, reduce deforestation, which is all good for lots of other reasons, it doesn't really help so much with this, this issue of air quality and um, emissions. So the conservation plans, for instance, that WWF has in place to reduce deforestation, that's all fine, but that the biggest, most important thing to do in terms of reducing the emissions and, um, and having a public health benefit is to protect the, uh, the peatlands. So this all goes back then to uh, this uh, massive increase in the last decade or so in uh, production of palm oil and other pulp and paper uh, that has 
drastically changed the land use in, uh, in this part of the world. So I don't know how many of you have been able to fly over this part of the world, but what you see is palm oil plantations like this, just as far as, uh, as, far as you can see. It's really incredibly uh, impressive. And with these fires, everybody loves to point the finger at the uh, oil palm um, industry. So we wanted to take a look at that and see really how much was the oil palm industry contributing. There were also some arrests of oil palm of officials that happened in relation to these um, emissions. And what we find is that the um, concessions overall, oil palm and, and timber concessions, are certainly a piece of the issue, certainly contributing to these emissions, but are not the major contributor. The, most of these fires occur out in um, degraded peat area, agricultural mosaics, um, non-forest kinds of systems where the, the concessions are partial contributors, but if you stop the fires on all of the concessions tomorrow, you would still have this problem, air quality problem, um, regardless. We also found that while people really love to blame the oil palm for everything, um, that the timber concessions in Sumatra are affecting the air quality in different population centers more so than oil palm. Although in Kalimantan, the oil palm is responsible for much of the emissions. So we can then use this tool to, um, to sort out what's contributing to the air quality in these different receptor sites. Another, a student of mine um, took on the question of are fires escaping? So again, so the oil palm concession officials will blame the fires on smallholders or vandal fires that are happening outside of the concessions, that they're started outside the concessions and then they travel into the concessions. And then the other way around, the people outside of the concessions will say the fire started on the concession and then moved to them. So it's like blaming like this. So we took on this issue to see if what actually science we can contribute, what understanding we can contribute uh, to see what's actually going on here. And what we find is that um, very few fires actually spread outside of where they start. So those fires that are starting on oil pump concessions pretty much stay on oil pump concessions. Those fires that, stay, that start in, um, in um, non-forest areas stay in non-forest areas. So this idea of blaming somebody else um, isn't really supported by, uh, by the data. This is a picture here, by the way, in central Kalimantan, and that's a young oil palm you can see there along the banks of this um, canal. So this is a canal that, uh, to drain the uh, peat swamps. So all of this um, culminates in being able to hopefully provide tools that can help with um, targeting where to focus fire management efforts to reduce the downwind smoke exposure. So from this we can say, for example, which province would be the most effective place to target um, fire management strategies. Um, and we can also um, quantify, this is where the epidemiologists come in, to quantify the uh, impacts of an event like happened in last year. So this is pretty major, 90, almost 92,000 excess deaths in Indonesia from this uh, event, and uh, 6,500 in Malaysia, 2,200 in Singapore. So it's not a trivial thing. And it's also something that people care about, care about on a daily basis. This is now getting a lot of political attention. So the new, the new president in Indonesia as of 2014 has taken this on now in a way that was not taken on um, previously and put in place some restoration, peatland restoration efforts and so on. So we're working to incorporate these tools that we've developed to be able to target where to focus those efforts. So that's an example of trying to match the science with the scale of the decision maker, which is pretty much at the national level in this case, trying to address what people care about on an everyday basis, and trying to provide something that helps with the solution, not just to say there's you know, 92,000 excess deaths, but what tools can we contribute based on our science that could, could help. So that's one example. A second example, um, gets back to what uh, Dr. Pim was talking about with the connectivity. So here we are in our very urbanizing 
world. And Bill Lawrence has drawn attention to this with a paper um, in Nature to point out the vast expansion of the road network throughout the world and throughout the tropics. So all that black here, that's, uh, that's roads. So these roads are for connectivity for, uh, for people. People need connectivity too, to, especially in an urbanizing world where goods need to move from uh, urban center to, uh, to urban center. So there's a really very big uh, expansion of roads and other types of transport infrastructure throughout the developing world. That's a very key, transport is a very key aspect of um, development, very important for people, and very much a focus of the current um, government in India, which is very pro-development and very much going quickly forward with plans to um, build highways, to pave roads, to uh, widen railways, uh, mines, uh, power plants, etc., all in the name of development. So, and undoubtedly, all of these things are important for development. I want to zoom in now to, um, to this part of central India, where the farmer was from that I showed you at the beginning. And this is a part of the country that Rudyard Kipling wrote the, um, the Jungle Book about. It's a very wonderful part of the world. You get a chance to visit. I mean, highly recommend it. Uh, and this is a, a part of the country that is um, very poor, but it's right in the middle, right smack in the middle of the country. So you can imagine any kind of uh, transport project that aims to connect the north to the south or the east to the west is going to go smack through uh, this part of the country. And indeed, that's what's happening. This is also a globally important part of the world in terms of tiger conservation. It holds 17% of India's tigers, and India holds most of the tigers um, in the world. So it's an important, from a conservation point of view, it's an important uh, important part of the world. It's also important in terms of watershed protection for uh, downstream um, users of the water that flows out of this uh, region. India has a, a really impressive protected area network considering that there's uh, uh, you know, 1.2 billion people and, and growing. About 5% of the land area is covered in protected areas. Those are the red dots there. But, as we know, as we've heard several times today, uh, protected areas are certainly a uh, critical part of conservation, but they can't do the job alone. That uh, we've known for a long time that parks cannot be large enough to be self-regulating ecological units, and particularly for large mammals like tigers, which is the kind of conservation focus in this part of the world, um, they need to roam over large areas and males need to disperse and it's absolutely critical in a very human dominated landscape like this, you can see in the background there how human dominated this landscape is, uh, that there is connectivity between these small protected areas. So here's zooming in to this, um, this region where the, you can see that there are quite a few protected areas and functional protected areas and quite a few tiger reserves which get a good amount of uh, resources uh, but they need to be connected and there's a lot of activity in this landscape like this this is a new highway going in it's being built um, as we speak we know that the protected areas in this landscape are indeed seem to be functional corridors somehow or other these tigers and leopards and some other large mammal species, are making it across these pretty human-dominated, hostile uh, landscapes. We know from genetic work that there is genetic flow between the populations in these uh, protected areas. So as these dispersing tigers uh, need to move across the landscape, they, they uh, encounter all kinds of things. They might have to go over some drying chilies like that, they're going to encounter um, livestock, which actually provides a lot of their, uh, their food, I think, as they're going across this landscape. Lots of, lots of people who, 
who use the forest just like they do uh, for food, for fuel wood, uh, lots of grazing cattle, lots of small scale agriculture. So you get the picture that this is a pretty hostile territory to uh, move across. So we're trying to, again, think of what's the right science we can be doing to recognize that these development needs are critical and important. As concert, I don't think we can very have a lot of confidence in saying that these, that highways are not important for development, that rail isn't important, that energy generation isn't important. All these are critically important. So the question is, how do we reconcile these needs for development and for the connectivity of the landscape? So for a long time, conservationists have been um, just opposing these types of infrastructure projects, but I think the mood is shifting to, uh, to recognize that these development needs are real and are important and are something that people care about. And what we need to do is use our science to identify how we can help maintain the connectivity, where would the road sidings be, what kind of mitigation measures might there be, like overpasses or underpasses or um, different kinds of options that can maintain the connectivity and also uh, address the development needs. So one of those ways of using the science is through connectivity modeling. This is some circuit scape um, modeling that we've been doing to identify those parts of the landscape where um, that are important for connectivity. So you wouldn't want to put a highway smack through um, these functional corridors. How do we think about where we put these infrastructure projects? And also, how do we think about uh, restoration efforts? Where would be the most effective places to put restoration efforts to, to um, excuse me, maintain the connectivity? So you can see here from these connectivity modeling results that there are a lot of bottlenecks in these uh, in these uh, different corridors, where the corridors become very thin. So some of those are related to highways like this, again, lots of highway development in this landscape. Some are related to industrial zones like, uh, like this. Some are related to coal mines like this. So you can, pretty hard to imagine a tiger traversing this, um, this coal mine. And some is related to uh, power plants like this. This was a, um, you know, brand new power plant that just went in that wasn't even in Google Earth. Um, and covering a very, very large area that was right smack in the, um, the corridor between two protected areas. And also tourism. So there's been a real increase in um, tourism in this region, which is wonderful. This is a lot of domestic Indian tourists, the growing middle class in the cities that are going to appreciate their biological heritage, which is fantastic. But there's also been an explosion of um, infrastructure and hotels and all this kind of thing around the uh, protected area which uh, needs to be managed. So again, this is an issue that is, is on the radar. There's lots of media attention. The Supreme Court has uh, gotten involved with a couple of decisions uh, related to connectivity and protected areas and, um, and tourism. So I think what we need to do now is to marshal our science to help with these decisions. So one of the ways to do that um, that we're just starting is through this very interesting program run out of the Nature Conservancy and the Wildlife Conservation Society, Science for Nature and People, SNAP. And that is the idea to synthesize science and connect, the most important part of this is to connect with the stakeholders that are the, that know how to use this information and will benefit from the information. So not that we're the scientists who have come up with some scientific result and throw it over the fence and hope that somebody picks it up, but work with the stakeholders from the outset to understand what's important to them and to frame the science in a way that is meaningful and useful to them and to engage the stakeholders. And I put this picture at the bottom here uh, uh, from a symposium where we were Attempting to bring together the stakeholders from the NGOs, from the, um, from the Forest Department, from different managers in that landscape. And I put it in because if you look very closely, you will find uh, Forrest Fleischman, who I don't know if he's here. If he's here, uh, somewhere in that picture, uh, Forrest is uh, there and contributed. It was great to have him at that symposium, and he, he really contributed. So that's what we're trying to do, is to, to sort of match the scale the science, the scale at which the decisions are being made, and to, um, 
to try to help think through options and solutions. So, oh, I'm somehow or other, I'm missing a slide here, but the third issue that I wanted to discuss, final example here, um, is related partially to this landscape, but a bigger issue about um, agricultural intensification. So Dr. Matusik uh, talked about that so wonderfully uh, in the context of the landscapes in which um, he works. But agricultural intensification is a, um, it's a fact <laughs> that the way that the human enterprise has been able to produce so much food over the last five or six decades has been through agricultural intensification, increasing more on the same amount of uh, land area. And it's clear that more agricultural intensification will be, uh, will be needed. But there's a critical piece of agricultural intensification that I think has been left out of the whole land sparing, land sharing debate. So probably you all are familiar with that literature, the idea, the sort of debate around whether a more useful strategy is to produce a lot on a little bit of land with high input, high output agriculture, or to uh, produce lower yields but over a larger area, which would be more um, biodiversity friendly. So that's the land sharing, land sparing debate. And that's been all about how do we produce enough food. But I think a key aspect of that debate uh, that has been left out is about the nutrition. So when we think about yields and about how much land we would need, it's been in terms of calories. How many tons of cereals do we need? Or how many calories do we need per person? But what we've been missing is thinking about what nutrients. How do we nourish people? That's what producing food is all about, is to provide nutrition. Uh, to, hopefully that's what it's about, to provide nutrition. So here in this landscape, but still we're in central India here, this is a, uh, a rice paddy, but during the, uh, during the dry season, during the wet season, it would look a lot different than that. Uh, but this is very low yield, and rice is the dominant crop in this landscape. So the focus of the Green Revolution, which has been what has been responsible for this massive increase in food production. So there's more calories produced today per capita, per person, uh, than there were 50 years ago, even considering the massive growth in population. So that's a pretty incredible feat. Whatever you might think of the outcome, it's a pretty incredible feat. That has been done largely by focusing on a very few amount of uh, crop, very small number of cereals, predominantly um, rice and wheat. So rice is a very, you know, gets a lot of focus, research focus, a lot of subsidies, a lot of attention, a lot of agricultural extension around um, rice. You can see here in this landscape, in this central India landscape, um, the yields of rice are way below the national average, like four times below the national average. The national average is the dot up there. Uh, and the, but it is the most dominant crop in the landscape. And the traditional minor cereals that have been important in people's diets, um, sorghum, millet, maize, not maize for livestock, but maize for, consume, for direct consumption, um, have been more important than they are currently. They've been disappearing uh, from the landscape, and you can see, as of now, they're, uh, they're minor components of the landscape. So this is all part of the trend in um, the mix of cereals that has changed with the agricultural intensification that has occurred over the last few decades. So this is for India. I can show you the same graphics, the same statistics for China, for, um, for the world at large, and it will look pretty much the same. That there has been a big increase in production of rice and wheat, and the other cereals like maize and millet and um, sorghum, barley and so on, have been declining in production. I know maize is a big producer in this country, but in India it's, it's, uh, it's, it's less so. Although more and more have been used to feed um, poultry. 
So that has led to this enormous explosion in the amount of calories produced in this world. But one of the issues that comes along with that is the micronutrients. So rice and wheat, very productive, high yielding, but, uh, but low in micronutrients. So all of these different crops, the y-axis there is the, um, the dietary reference intake per 100 grams. So that's kind of the unit that you see on, your, on the labels, how much nutrition you get out of 100 grams. So this work is being done in consultation with um, nutritionists, which is really a fascinating discipline to work with. But all of these different um, cereals have pretty much the same energy content, the same calories per 100 grams, but very different in terms, particularly in terms of the micronutrients, iron and zinc. So in terms of uh, the conservation, we want to use land efficiently so that we use less of it. We want to use it well so we don't have to deforest the entire Amazon or deforest vast areas of land to produce the food that, that, uh, that people need. So from an ecological perspective, our goal is to use land efficiently. From a nutritionist perspective, the goal is to provide nutritious food, and that means producing food with high nutritional content. So how do we bring, so these have been kind of separate worlds. So how do we bring those ideas together? So we're trying to think through what metrics we can use, what different way of thinking about our agricultural systems we can put forward to, uh, to reconcile this idea of using land efficiently and at the same time providing um, nutritious food. So one step in that direction is this metric that um, we call nutritional yield, which is a way to quantify basically how many, for each micronutrient, take iron, how many adults could get 100% of their iron requirement off of a hectare of land, which is a different measure than how many calories per hectare does that, um, does that hectare produce. So a way to incorporate the nutritional content of what's being produced and try to add to the discussion, the, the land sparing, land sharing, to bring in the notion that we also need to be paying attention to not just feeding people, but feeding people well and feeding people nutritiously um, and take into account the micronutrient content of the food. Another aspect is uh, the climate. I agree 100% with, uh, with Jane's words this morning about, uh, about, the, uh, about climate being not the be all and end all and important, of course. Um, that said, in this region, in this part of the world, climate is a very big issue for, uh, for agriculture. With or without climate change, climate variability is a very big issue. So farmers will literally live and die uh, by the monsoon. So another aspect to take into account when we think about what, uh, what crops to focus on for intensification and how we think about feeding all these urban mouths that are being added to the, um, added to the population that needs to be fed, well, how resilient are these different cereals to um, variability in rainfall? And what we find in this landscape, again, this is a central India landscape, that uh, rice, which again is the dominant crop, is also the least resilient to variability in precipitation. This is a, a mixed effect model, taking into account various factors, and the higher the coefficient, the less resilient that cereal is. So rice is um, a less resilient, rice and maize are less resilient, and the traditional uh, minor cereals like sorghum and small millet um, have been adapted for dry conditions, and uh, that shows in these data here. So just as a way to try to put together these various factors, so decisions are made on, there's so many different, um, different factors to take into consideration, so many objectives, that you're dealing with multiple objectives, so how do you portray all of these different objectives? So here's an attempt, I don't know if it's successful or not, to portray uh, for these different um, cereals, these different attributes these different factors, how resilient uh, these cereals are, again, just in this landscape, to precipitation, variability, to temperature, um, their yields, and also their nutritional yields in terms of protein, iron, and energy. So the, the more filled out these, um, 
these radial diagrams are, the more resilient and higher nutritional yields these cereals are, are uh, providing. So rice does not come out looking particularly well for this, uh, for this landscape. So the idea is that these kind, kinds of metrics, again, this takes a lot of working with the stakeholders and discussions and understanding what's important to different, different stakeholders, uh, to convey these multiple objectives of agricultural systems, to feed people, to nourish people, to provide livelihoods, to be resilient to um, climate variability. So we have a lot of work ahead of us uh, in that regard. But to date, I think nutrition hasn't really been incorporated to the extent that it should be in this trade-off thinking of, um, with agricultural intensification. So it's fun to work with nutritionists to, um, to try to think through this problem. So, Back to these three points, so those were three examples of wading through this very messy, thorny kind of work that we do to just try to figure out what can be helpful in these very consequential decisions that are being made right at this time, these decisions that are being put in place um, throughout the tropics, and these decisions that are being made now about roads, about connectivity, about protected areas, about what crops are grown, are going to be in place for a long time, for 50, 100 years. So it's a really very critical time. And um, still just trying to think about how our science can be the most useful. And this is all in the context of um, use-inspired basic research. So if you're familiar with uh, Pasteur's quadrant here, this will be familiar to you that all kinds of research are useful. But when, it's particularly I think about the kinds of research that um, I think is important now to do is inspired by this incredible urbanization dynamic and the changing demands for resources uh, in the world uh, today. And I don't want to shamelessly promote uh, the book <laughs> that uh, Jessica mentioned, but the point of that book is to trace human history and human civilization around this nexus that we've been talking about all day today, the nexus between um, people, society, and the way that we produce food as the closest way that we interact with nature. And to trace our history as one of innovation and one of being very clever in many ways and technologies that we've come up with, which inevitably come in to cause some kind of problem, ecological problem, but then we come up with the next solution. So we're in this cycle, and I think we will always be in this cycle, of um, creating problems and creating solutions. So the solutions we come up with today are going to create new problems that we can't even think about uh, down the road, and then we'll come up with solutions to that. So there's not that there's one magic solution that we're all waiting to discover. It's the process of innovation, and the way I look at it is that the point that we are right now is that we're at a point where we know what the problems are that we've created with um, agricultural intensification and the way we've used our resources over the last 50 years or so. And where we are now is to go that next step and come up with the next generation of solutions, which will only be one generation of solutions, and then we'll have more problems. So we will always be in this cycle of um, creating problems and solving problems. So this work that I've described clearly spans many disciplines and many different collaborators who are delightful to, uh, to work with, so I thank all of them. And I'm happy to share any references or ideas with you, and thank you very much. And again, thank you to the organizers for this wonderful presentation.